It's 2024, a year that will show us things we've never seen before. And tonight, we're going to see a close-up of Peter Graves' nipple. Join me for Killers from Space from 1954. You know, Bob, in the sequel, we could give them eyes that were actually snow balls, you know, the, the pastry. They get the pink ones and say, help us, Peter Graves. We're all dying of pink eye. Our only export is coffee crumb cake. Don't ask where we get the coffee crumbs from. Oh, hi there. It snuck up on me just like the new year. Welcome to Creature Features, now in its 16th year. And I, of course, am your host, Al Omega, the Alpha and Omega of all things science fiction and horror. Before we get into tonight's show, I want to thank all my fans for sticking by me and enjoying the show. And hopefully you're all going and checking out my Roku channel, Creature Features Network. I did want to let you know that we're now being carried locally by North Bay KORK TV, Cork TV. Now on to our new year and our new movie. Tonight we have a classic piece of sci-fi fluff, fresh from the height of the Cold War and McCarthyism and the top of the list for drive-in fodder. I don't want to say this was a cheaply made movie, but almost half of it is simply stock footage. So all you filmmakers out there that say you can't make a film, remember, all you need is some stock footage. And these days, maybe AI. Tonight's movie is Killers from Space from 1954. Like so many movies of the times, it revolves around nuclear testing, aliens, invasions, it's sort of a tiny subplot about nuclear radiation mutating animals into giant size. I always say people laugh at the Japanese for their giant kaiju monsters, but if you're the only country that's actually had a nuclear bomb dropped on you twice, you get to be afraid of giant nuclear mutations and your giant monsters. Here in America, we're more like hoping for them rather than being afraid of them. I would say this movie ranks just under teenagers from outer space. So let's get into the who did what, as our director was W. Lee Wilder, who left us in 82, and he did movies like The Omegans, and The Man Without a Body, and Phantom from Space, which we've done. He's originally from Susha, Galicia, in Austria-Hungary, which is now currently Poland. He has a, an actually a, a famous, actually much more famous brother, Billy Wilder, who he always referred to as that dull son of a beep. A little known fact is, he started out having his own purse company. So he used to make purses before he became a famous producer. This was written by William Rayner, who left us in 94, and he wrote for such TV specials as The Dukes of Hazard, Different Strokes, and Welcome Back, Kata. He even did When Things Were Rotten. Now, that's a TV show that nobody remembers, but I loved it. So, if anyone's got a download or a DVD of it, let me know. He's originally from Bellingham, Washington, United States. And in an odd set of circumstances, his first wife is listed only as June R. That's it, nothing else. Not terribly sure who she actually was. This was co-written by Miles Wilder, who left us in 2010, and he wrote for things like CPO Sharky, you hockey puck, and the Adams Family cartoon, and Korg, 70,000 years B.C. 
He's originally from New York, New York. And his father was Lee Wilder. So now we have the bifecta of badness, sort of. You know, one of these days I'm going to have to figure out, you know, what it is when you have one person doing two bits and uh, two people that are connected doing uh, different bits. I don't know. We'll get that morphology all figured out one day. Now, this stars Peter Graves, that so many of us know from Mission Impossible, or perhaps Airplane. But he's done a lot of other stuff. He's done voices. He did the voices for Minority Team. Minora Team. There's a cartoon you probably haven't seen. He was also in Men in Black 2. And in the 1999 version of House on Haunted Hill. He worked right up to the end. His last movie was in 2010, and that's the year he passed away. Originally from Minneapolis, Minnesota, land of blonde hair and blue ears, uh, his original last name was Arness, and yes, that means that he's James Arness's brother. Now, he was actually quite athletic in his younger years and played the saxophone, so you girls, you missed out. By the time he was 16, he was a radio announcer with that great voice of his, and then he spent two years in the Army Air Force as a vet as a combat officer. Thank you. Gets it right for you. So he is a veteran, and he studied drama at the University of Minnesota and then went off to Hollywood, where he started off in vet television and then made his first film debut in Rogue River from 1951. Now, many people don't know he was almost not in Airplane. When his agent sent him the script, he thought it was the worst piece of junk he'd ever seen. But after meeting with the, the Zucker brothers, he changed his mind. Now, I'm sure the Zucker brothers didn't like come over and loom over him and go, look, you're going to make this movie, okay? Why do I think that? Well, let's just say when they were out shilling for Top Secret, an excellent movie, uh... They, I, I, I was sort of there, and they tried to call security on me, not realizing that I was actually head of security at that moment. Apparently, they have a very poor sense of humor. Now, he was married to his wife for nearly 60 years, something you don't see much anymore. He didn't come back to the new Mission Impossible movies because he felt he just couldn't play the same character going bad. Now, I can understand that. In an odd bit of It's a Small World, he was also in Mission Impossible 1988, which had Greg Morris in it, whose son, Phil Moore, grew up with uh, Mr. Graves' children and always a big fan of the series, so it must have been really cool for him to get to see his dad now involved with it. Now, interestingly, before he could marry his wife, her parents said he had to go out and get a steady job, so he went out and became an actor. Now, while I'm glad that he became an actor, that's kind of not what I would call a steady job. In fact, if I were her, I'd be thinking, oh gosh, he's not coming back ever. <laughs> now, he has two, count them, two selected films for the National Film Registry at the Library of Congress. Night of the Hunter from 1955 and Airplane from 1980. Now, as his beautiful wife in this, Ella Martin, we have Barbara Best Star. And this was her second to last film, but she was in things like Death Valley Days and Dragnet and Sheena, Queen of the Jungle. I don't think she played Sheena. She's originally from Manhattan, New York, and she only did about a dozen films in TV. As Colonel Banks, we have James C.A., and he left us in 92, and he did movies like Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, and Invaders, and Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. He's originally from Pasadena, California, and when he started out at Paramount, they really thought he'd be, you know, a romantic lead. But he wound up being the villain, or at least very stern and officious, you know, types like military officers. Throughout the 40s and 50s, he became the voice of authority in so many movies that we love, and he had some trouble with names. Uh, there were some sources that said his middle initial was A, the UN Census says it's a C, military enlistment records say it's a W, so go figure, 
After all, the military is never wrong, right? Now, during World War II, he was actually very active in training films, doing things like the flight characteristics of the A-20. You know, Bob, I don't know if we could show those, even if we could get a hold of them, but it'd be interesting to find out. In the part of Briggs, we have Steve Pendleton, and he left the building in 84, and he did a lot of police and military cowboy-type stuff. So he's in things like The Virginian, Big Valley, Tora, 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 or as we like to make call the remake, Tora Cubed. He was also in Get Smart and Batman, and even in Run, Joe, Run, a series which I loved, and I can only ever find one episode, so if any of you have any more episodes from the 1974 show Run, Joe, Run, let me know. Now, he's originally from New York, New York, and again, names do things with people, weird, I don't know. On Broadway, he was credited as Gaylord Pendleton, or sometimes as Gay Pendleton. So, go figure. As Dr. Kurt Kruger, we have Frank Gerstel, and he left us in 1970, and he was in movies like The Magnetic Monster, Alfred Hitchcock Presents, and The Four Skulls of Jonathan Drank which we've done. His last piece was the piece I remember him best about him. There was a show back in the 60s called The Banana Splits. And they had these cartoon segments, and one was The Arabian Nights. And he voiced the, the strong man. I think his name was uh, Rashid. That's it, Rashid. And... I just love the banana splits. I was a card-carrying member of the club. Another person that's originally from New York, New York, he usually played tough guys, authoritarian people, really. Uh, he is credited for the most film noir line ever made, where he played a doctor in the movie DOA. He's telling someone that has been poisoned, but the person is still alive, and he says, you've been murdered. Now, our alien friend, Deneb, we have John Frederick, and he left us in 2012. And he was in movies like Prehistoric Woman and The Alligator People and Pussycat, Pussycat, I Love You. Yeah, that's a great film. Check that one out. He's originally from Norwalk, Iowa. He's a big fella at six feet two. And he studied at Drake University of Iowa and had a brief teaching career before he went into acting. Now, fair warning, there is no nudity or excessive violence in this movie. There are some archetypes and racial slurs, however, used. For instance, the fighter squadron's call signs are Tar Baby 1 and Tar Baby 2. Now, as always, we have a short, and then we're into tonight's movie's Killers from Space from 1954. You know, Bob, after that intro, I don't think I want to eat snowballs anymore. <laughs> to see has not happened yet these are scenes from that story a story that will happen when man has built a space station orbiting above the earth a station that will be a research center in which dedicated people such as these will conduct experiments in many sciences for the benefit of mankind this is the story of an experiment plunging out of control endangering the lives of those aboard the space station confines of a space station leave no room for personal animosities. You each have separate projects which require no scientific cooperation between you for the next five days. It's Dr. Randolph in his bio lab. Something's gone wrong. Colonel, I placed myself in quarantine. What can we do for you? You can't. General. 
excuse me, Ed. Uh, for a few minutes there, I was the kid with his nose pressed against a plate glass window of a store looking at a hot rod he never dry. It's all your store, Sam. Even that space station orbiting out there. Why don't you just sign on as a member of the crew? It's my job to pick men who can serve a useful function up there. But that's got nothing to do with why you bird dogged me here. Oh, yes, it has. As you know, I'm going up to the station tonight. And I just got the time schedule and the scientists and their projects. This is a genuine multigraph reproduction of my signature. Yes, sir. I know that Dr. Horton is one of our outstanding physicists and of the importance of Dr. Randolph's work in biology. But they're both scheduled for the first 15-day period, together. Well, the committee felt that their projects deserved that priority, ahead of the other scientists. I'm sure that the disagreements they've had in the past, Sam, and I'm sorry to disagree with you, but when those two cool, detached scientific minds get within radar distance of each other, it makes the Hatfield-McCoy feud seem more friendly than Damon and Pythias. Can't you handle them on your station? Yes, sir. I know I could, but what would it prove? I want to avoid trouble a thousand miles out with your permission. To do what? Ask one of them to delay it for 15 days and switch with the next scientist going up. If you can work that out with Damon and Pythias, you got a deal. I think that should prove a necessity to you, Colonel. Well, Dr. Horton, you're the expert. I have to rely on your word. Patterns similar to these will occur at full intensity during the next period. And not again for two years. Oh, I can't wait to go. Isn't Dr. Randolph's work equally as important as yours? I'm sure he thinks so. Doc, let me explain something to you. This station that you're going to is a big wheel spinning around a thousand miles in space. Everything aboard it is artificial. Water we drink, air we breathe, even gravity. Something we can't fake is the ability of one man to get along with another. I know that, Ken. Aboard a space station, we all tie our shoelaces in the morning so we don't trip over each other all day long. What does that mean? It means simply this. That unless Dr. Randolph agrees to delay, you and he will be playing musical chairs to see who gets to go first. Come in. Hello, Colonel. Dr. Randolph, I am not going to mince words. That's not your reputation. You've seen the schedule. And tried to reach you. To inform me that you think your work is far more important than Dr. Horton's. But I do. As commanding officer of a space station, I cannot allow two men with personal antagonisms aboard at the same time. The solution's simple. Yes, I know. Dr. Horton has already suggested it. He said to leave you behind. I agree. Ooh, what? I thought that you and he... Don't get along, I believe, is the polite way it's put. Well, then why? Well, Colonel, uh, some bacteriological specimens that I was expecting from India have been delayed, so uh, I can use the extra days here. Do I thank you, or do you thank me? I'm not sure, but uh, you mind if I don't thank Dr. Horton? Macaulay's destination, the space station Astra, 1,075 miles above the Earth, making a complete orbit every two hours, designed to house the laboratories and research centers that would enable scientists to probe for dramatic advancements in all fields of science. Macaulay, along with Dr. Horton, approached the space station in the rocket ship. The crew in the space station waited to moor the ship in the airlock located in the hub of the orbiting station. An airlock that enabled personnel to proceed from rocket ship to space station. Well, welcome back, sir. Hello, Murph. Good to see you. Is this our new customer? Mm -hmm. Can I help you, Doctor? Uh, yes, thank you. There you are. Well, Dr. Horton, this is Lieutenant Murphy, our station executive officer. How do you do, sir? How do you do, Lieutenant? Now, Colonel, if I can get my equipment moved into a lab... Do you want to go to work right away, or take time for a cup of coffee? Well, uh, right this way, gentlemen. The club car is in full operation. Glad to see you, Colonel. Hello, Ham. You found any new stars later? Several million. Oh, Dr. Horton, this is Dr. Hamilton, our station astronomer. Doctor, glad to meet you, Hamilton. Dr. Horton's going to be with us a couple of weeks doing some high-frequency experiments. Well, don't count on me finishing in just two weeks, Colonel. I may have to stay here a good deal longer than that. Well, we'll 
hope for the best, Doctor. In any case, it's a pleasure to have you aboard. Thank you. Now, Colonel, I really feel I should be getting my equipment set up. All right, Murph, take Dr. Horton to his quarters and show him the compartment that's been set aside as his laboratory. Be glad to, sir. Right this way, sir. Thank you. Top man, Horton. Does some really outstanding work in high frequencies. Yet an odd one, too. It's terribly wrapped up in his work. Yes, he does indeed. This is Space Station Astro to Ground Control. Astro to Ground Control. Come in, please. Over. Ground Control to Station Astra. Reading it loud and clear. How you doing, Murphy? Since my vacation, you're looking pretty good. What's on your mind? Hold on, Ground Control. I've lost you. Murphy. If you do the regular maintenance work on your circuits, that wouldn't happen. There's nothing wrong with my maintenance work. It's just that every time Dr. Horton goes into gear with that high frequency work of his, my communications black out. What's on your mind? Dr. Horton is asking again for a confirmation of his request that special equipment be sent up immediately. My log shows that this is the third time he's requested information. Cancel that confirmation request. That's all. End of transmission. Over and out. I'll tell Dr. Horton that his requisitions get prompt attention as a matter of course. Excuse me, Doctor. I just wanted to tell you that ground control acknowledged your requisition the first time that you made it. There is no need to clutter up the communication system with repeated requests. Now, sir, what can I do for you? Nothing, doctor. I just dropped in to find out how you were doing in view of your time limitation. Very well, thank you. Now, if you'll excuse me. Thirty-six star photos in this transmission, Doc, and from the little I know, they look like beauties. I guess that smog down below is even harder on a telescope eye than it is on ours. <laughs> We're going to learn things about the universe that we never even imagined. Mm -hmm. Space Station Astra, come in, please. This is Ground Control. Message for Dr. Horton. Requisition numbered A-22, less items 3 and 5, now aboard supply ship, having left here 10.50 this date. Arrival Astra estimated 12.50 this date. Items 3 and 5 will follow when available. Is that all? For Colonel McCauley from General Warren. Dr. Randolph arriving Astra on supply ship with fragile and sensitive equipment. Please extend fullest cooperation in all available facilities. And transmission. Acknowledge, please. Hold it. This is McCauley. Dr. Randolph wasn't due up here for five days with the supply ship. What are the reasons for the change in scheduling? I'm sorry, sir, I don't know. Back. Transmission saved and acknowledged. astronomer. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Gravity. Just because you spin this big thing around on an axis. You know, your mind believes it, but your emotions don't. <laughs> well, Doctor? Well, it's Colonel. Those uh, cultures from India arrived sooner than I thought. Doctor, I don't know or care how you changed the original scheduling. My job is to run this space station so a scientist like yourselves can do your best work. You will receive complete courtesy and cooperation. I expect the same in return. Colonel McCauley, items three and five have been omitted from my requisition. You were notified of that several hours ago. They'll be sent up when they're available. Well, that's no good. I need them now. Hello, Horton. Or were by any chance my items three and five omitted because of a weight problem in bringing Dr. Randolph and his gear up on this flight? You know better than that. And gentlemen, I'm going to say this just once. 
You each have separate projects which require no scientific cooperation between you for the next five days. The confines of a space station leave no room for personal animosities. I understand, Colonel. Now, Doctor, perhaps you'd like me to show you to your lab. I would indeed. Come in. Uh, Dr. Horton asked me to send this. Send it. What was all that about? An extracurricular scientific experiment. Dr. Horton is putting on a little pressure for an extension of his time up here on the theory that if it worked for Dr. Randolph, it's going to work for him. your experiments, Dr. Horton, mm -hmm. because you have only two days left. Are you sure, Colonel? Your request for an extension has been denied. Here, what is it? Sir, you better get the control on the double. I'll be right up. What is it? Dr. Randolph in his bio lab. Something's gone wrong. Doc, what's the matter? Colonel, I placed myself in quarantine. Sealed myself off from the rest of the crew. Something, uh, a new strain of virus seems to have gotten out of control. Some of it may have gotten through already. It may be deadly. Hold it, Doc. Murph, shut off the ventilation system to Doc's lab. Get the crew in the mess hall and break out the decontamination equipment right now. Doc, you've got your oxygen and emergency rations in there. I know. So, let me see what I can try to do for myself. What can we do for you? You can't. I had everything under control. Some unknown strain of virus has been created by some strong radiation coming from inside the station. It could destroy us all. Radiation from the inside? We notified ground control of our quarantine condition here, so there'll be no contact. Repeat. No contact here. What about the cargo? Half of it is top priority. Dump it. I'll send out a crew to pick it up as soon as I can. Roger. Macaulay to station crew. Supply rocket with space dump. Repeat, space dump cargo. Prepare for operation to retrieve. Colonel, I have checked with Dr. Horton. Neither one of us can trace any source of strange radiation coming from inside the station. You know our hull gives protection from the outside. Mm-hmm. Oh, Kalani, you'll be in charge out there, and we need that cargo. There's that interference from Horton again. We've been thinking only of radioactivity. Yeah, and this is magnetic. Do you think it's possible? There's a pretty potent frequencies Dr. Horton's working with. I better check it out. Hello. I'm not a biologist, but I am a physicist. And your idea is quite extraordinary. I don't know how long Dr. Randolph is going to be able to fight this thing by himself. I, uh, 
I may have overlooked one important factor. What is it? Certain controlled electronic frequencies have been known to affect new strains of bacteria. Colonel, let me see what I can come up with. Please let me know the minute you have something. Well, Harkness says it's just possible that some of his work may have affected Dr. Randolph's experiments. Is there anything I can do? Mm-hmm. In that great big star-filled universe of yours, see if you can find a couple of angels. We're going to need all the help we can get. Yes, Horton here. What do you want, Horton? I think perhaps I can help you, Doctor. I doubt it, Dr. Randolph. Now listen to me, please. It's just possible that the high frequencies I've been using in my work may have something to do with this. Yes. Certain frequencies have been known to... to cause uncontrolled mutation of viruses. Exactly. Doctor, I can't bring my equipment to you. So you must come to my lab with your cultures. We can expose them and you to my high-frequency magnetic fields. Uh, that's impossible, Horton. I must remain in quarantine. But contamination of a whole station would be probable. Contamination of you would be inevitable. Doctor. I'll be in touch with you shortly. Working together, what are you trying to do, play guinea pig? Dr. Randolph and I have discussed it. Now, what we have to do is impossible at long range. And I can't bring my equipment to him. What's your plan? Well, I may be able to arrest his own condition before it's too late. If we can get him to my lab. But Randolph can't break quarantine, much less go through the other sections. He'd be a walking plague. That's true. But if Dr. Horton's willing to take the chance, we've got to find a way. Well, tube lock number two could be isolated. He could go through there. And how are you going to get him out of his lab? Both labs have space suits and airlocks. I could guide him to Doc Horton through space. Murph, tell Randolph to get into his suit. Pack his test tubes and pressurized containers, and I'll meet him outside the airlock. <laughs> weightless in the vacuum of space, traveled at the same speed as the space station. His jetpack, acting like a miniature rocket, would enable him to move about and change his direction.
talk. Save the breath. We've got work to do. Space Station Astra, come in, please. Any further report on Dr. Randolph's condition? No improvement in 48 hours. Space Station Astra, come in, please. General Warren calling for Colonel McCauley. I'm sorry, Zelma, I have nothing further to report. That's Horton. Ground control, stand by. Yes, Doc, what is it? Dr. Randolph is sleeping. We've arrested the activity. Did you hear that, ground control? Anything else, Doc? We found a magnetic frequency that will make the virus dormant until we can develop or find a more permanent remedy. Macaulay to ground control. Randolph is okay. Signing off for now. What's happened? No sweat. It's all over now. Can you send us some hot soup? <laughs> Be coming up right now, Doc. Glad that's finished. Yes, and maybe something pretty good is beginning. Incredible, isn't it? Maybe. Yes, it is. What is? You too. Colonel, we may have hit on something to help the man's attack against disease. Well, our next trip to your space station should prove that out. Would you gentlemen like me to arrange for you to go separately? Plats, Nevada. The time, 6.15 a.m. The climax of arduous planning. Operation A-bomb test underway. Detonation minus two minutes. Military personnel, from Buck Private to top-ranking brass, Men from research and news services move into position. The bomb carrying plane makes its initial run. Radar with eyes that never sleep. Special equipment go into operation. All orders are carried out with split second precision. Warning is given to all commercial aircraft to stay out of the test area. Detonation minus 70 seconds. Planes take to the air, carrying sensitive instruments and nuclear scientists, ready to record the radioactivity from the closest possible vantage point. Detonation minus 40 seconds. The bomb carrying plane nears the target. Tension mounts as all members of the flight crew anticipate the task to pinpoint the bomb on a tiny circle of Earth below. Now the plane wings its way toward ground zero. Warning signal is sounded. All observers prepare for the blinding flash of the bomb. Detonation minus 20 seconds. Command of the plane is given to the bombardier. Ground zero dead ahead. The key man now goes into action. Bomb bay doors open. Detonation minus 10 seconds, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0.
report now. Have the figures ready. Control from Tar Baby 2. Over. Go ahead, Tar Baby 2. We're circling ground zero at radius of 7.5 miles. Altitude 1, 5, 0, 0, 0 feet. Airspeed 4, 5, 0. Stand by. Roger and over. She's all yours. This is Dr. Martin. Here are the readings. 0.378 negative, second indicator. 1.08 negative, radiation 0.4. Over. Roger, proceed according to plan. We'll go and up. Come in, Tar Baby 2. Come in, Tar Baby 2. We've lost contact, sir. Baker 2, sir. Yes, sir. All patrol craft in test area. This is a May Day. Repeat, this is a May Day. Proceed to segment Baker 17. Search for Tar Baby 2. Baby 7. Wreckage sighted southwest corner Soledad Flats. Ship appears completely demolished. No sign of survivors. Over. Roger Tar Baby 7. Circle wreckage at 1000 feet until arrival of helicopter rescue unit. Dr. Kruger, Colonel Banks speaking. Would you mind coming into my office right away, please? Thank you. As I was saying, our search planes found the wreckage of your husband's plane, Mrs. Martin. A rescue crew was sent out, but... But they must have reached the wreckage hours ago. Why can't they find him? I honestly don't know, Mrs. Martin. Yes, come in. They found the pilot dead in the wreckage. And according to all reports, no one could have bailed out. I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Martin. Martin, are you all right? I... I am, yes. 
It's Dr. Martin. Call the base hospital. Come on, doctor. Come on. All right, look up to your right. And now look over to your left. All right, get up now. seems all right. Except, can't you recall anything that happened from the time your plane crashed until... I remember the controls froze. The next thing I saw was the main gate of the base. Your plane was completely demolished. The pilot burned to death. And you show up the picture of health. Are you sure you weren't driven here? Piloted. You don't remember where you got this? Mm -mm. You know, your medical chart shows no indication of any scars on your body. I must have got it in a crash. Uh, now, this was surgery. A very skillful incision. I've never had an operation. Now, that's what I don't understand. Mr. Briggs. Colonel Bank. How are you, Mr. Briggs? Fine, how are you? Fine. I see the FBI doesn't waste much time. Well, uh, not if we can help it, Colonel. Oh, you know our base surgeon, Major Clift? Sure. How have you been, Major? How do you do? Uh, well, I guess you gentlemen have business to discuss. Oh, no, no. This won't take a minute. Sit down. <laughs> Sit down, please, please, gentlemen. Cigarette. Oh, thank you. I understand you've already talked with Dr. Martin. I just left him. You know, our Colonel, um, According to my files, Dr. Martin is just about the key man on this nuclear project. Yes, along with Dr. Kruger, he is. Mm -hmm. Well, I know they're both good friends and, uh, well, both have knowledge and access to top secret information. Well, that's very true, but there's no reason to suspect that oh, they... Oh, we can, uh, we can suspect anything, Colonel. Until Dr. Martin accounts for every minute from the time of the crash. The shock must have caused a mental block. His mind doesn't want to remember the details. The, the origin of the scar on his chest, how he got back to the base under his own power. Did you ever stop to think that perhaps this Dr. Martin isn't really the Dr. Martin? What are you getting at? What I mean is that uh, this man could be an imposter. They do check. That's what I've been waiting for. Thanks. Get me Colonel Banks to the base, please. No, no, I'll wait. Oh, yes, Mr. Briggs. Any news on the line you were getting on Dr. Martin? Just heard from Washington. Well, I was wrong. This is our man, all right. His prints and description check right down the line. Now, here's what I suggest you do. But you see, he's in excellent physical condition, yet you're keeping him in the base hospital. Why? Mrs. Martin, you must realize that your husband is engaged in a highly secret work. If this experience had, well, affected his mind... Are you trying to tell me that Doc is... No, no, no. It's nothing serious, Mrs. Martin. His reflexes are excellent. Except for that one lapse of memory, his mind is perfectly clear. Isn't that natural under the circumstances? Yes. Except for the question of the scar on his chest. I know he didn't have it before the crash. Well, I'm sure he didn't, Mrs. Martin. But you see, it would be impossible for a wound of this size to have healed so quickly and without medical attention. Well, you can't keep him here indefinitely. Well, we don't intend to. Uh, we asked you to come down here because we've decided to let you take him home. Provided you can keep him quiet and he gets in the press. I understand. Now we'll just have to take that vacation he's been wanting for so long. Vacation? To watch him, you'd think you'd never heard of one. Yes, he must have asked me a hundred times when the next test was scheduled. He's anxious to take his own readings again. 
Well, he did have a key part in the planning of these projects. Well, is there anything he should or shouldn't be allowed to do? No. Except he does need diversion. Anything that won't upset or excite him. I see. Movies, bridge, drives, things like That's that. Right. Well, you're the doctor now. Just see that he gets plenty of rest. Thank you. Goodbye, Colonel. Goodbye. See you later, Major. Sergeant Bandero. Anything I can do for you, Doctor? I wondered if there were any last-minute orders on another atomic test. What do you mean you can't tell me? Sorry, sir. Regulations. I can't give out information to anyone. No, sir. It won't do you any good to come down. All right. We'll see about that. You going to say anything? No. Look, I know they're ready for another test, and I should be there. Can't you understand that they don't want you around for your own good? I don't need their sympathy. There's nothing wrong with me. Then why are you acting this way? You're all on edge. If you don't slow down, I don't know what's going to happen. You really believe that, don't you? Look, Doug, if you won't take it easy for your own sake, please, do it for mine. considered a very good security risk. Me? A security risk? My present state? What's the matter with me? How long am I to be considered? Only temporarily. The results of the test will be available for your study when you return to work. I am ready, Colonel. To us, you're still a very sick man. My advice to you is to go home and relax, as you were ordered. Relax, relax. And if I don't? Then you'll be confined to the base hospital till you change your mind. Now, what's it going to be?
Well, Doctor? Oh, Dr. Martin. I didn't expect you back so soon. Well, haven't you heard? I'm a metal king. Can't even be trusted with my own work. Ah! I'm going to go berserk at any minute. Colonel Banks will fill you in on the details. Now, uh, don't, don't tell me. Let me see. You're, uh... I know, I know. You're Miss uh, Vincent, the secretary I share with, uh... Oh, hmm? Doctor, you can't be serious. Uh, there was no one in your office, so I thought you wouldn't mind. Oh, that's all right. It's all right. As far as I'm concerned, you can take the rest of the day off. Are you sure? Mm-hmm. No, oh, I don't really belong here. I just, uh, just came in to pick up a few personal things from my desk. Goodbye, Doctor. Goodbye. Delicious things to eat. The popcorn can't be beat. The sparkling drinks are just dandy. The chocolate bars and that candy. So let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Back to creature features. Now, as always, if you've been watching the show, and you know you should, you know this is the part of the show where we talk about the person that never gets talked about. And this week, it's the gas station attendant, played by Lester Doerr. Remarkably, this is not his only job. In fact, he has a huge number of credits to his name, with over 500 screen credits. Many of them, very short. He was in the 1937 movie Dick Tracy, and the 1937 movie Topper. He was also in The Flying Discs Men from Mars in 1950. And perhaps most notably, he was in Green Acres. Arnold Ziffel, where are you now? Originally from Baston, Massachusetts, he was one of the original members of the Screen Actors Guild back in 1933. Thank you. 
Main gate, main gate, please. Just a minute, Doctor. Main gate, Sergeant Powers. Dr. Kruger? Dr. Kruger, Dr. Kruger. No, he checked out. Yeah, about 20 minutes ago. Okay. Sorry to keep you waiting, Doctor. That's all right. Okay, Doctor. Do you sign out, please? We'll post a couple of men outside of Dr. Kruger's office. Give me Colonel Banks at the officers' club. Thank you, Doctor. Good night. Dr. Kruger? Yes. My name's Briggs. I'm from the FBI. Briggs. Briggs. Of course. I've heard of you. <laughs> I wonder if you'd mind uh, returning to your office with me. Well, what seems to be the trouble? Oh, just a few things we'd like to straighten out. Concerns me? Well, I'm afraid so, Doctor. And take your own car if you like. I'll meet you there. All right, I will. Papers seem to be intact. Is this all uh, classified information, Doctor? Of course. You know, according to security regulations, that vault should have been locked before you left. But I'm certain I did lock it. All right, then tell me this. Who besides yourself has access to the combination? Well, the Colonel here and Dr. Martin. Dr. Martin. He was in the building this afternoon. That's right. We saw him in my office. He left around 4 o'clock on orders. He dismissed the secretary a few minutes later, but he... he didn't sign out of here until 20 minutes after you left. After I did? Well, there must be some mistake. I personally checked his office just as I was leaving, and he wasn't there. You always do that, Doctor? No, but Dr. Martin has been acting... well... quite strange of late. Yes, he certainly has. His wife telephoned to say that he hadn't come home as usual. I was very much concerned about it. So am I. He still hasn't shown up yet. What kind of pipe tobacco do you use, Dr. Kruger? Me? Why, I don't smoke at all. Did you, Colonel? Cigarettes. What are you driving at? Funny. How long has Dr. Martin been using this brand of tobacco? But I really don't know why. Well, now, Mrs. Martin, you say you have no idea where he could be at this hour. Well, I know he's never been this late before without telephoning. Well, I hate to ask this, but have you ever had any suspicion that there might be another woman? Certainly not. I'm sorry, Mrs. Martin. Just why are you asking me these questions? Well, let's put it this way. Has he made any new friends lately? You know, people not in the usual group. You know, the only people we've seen in months have been connected with the Institute. Excuse me. Hello? Yes, just a moment. It's for you, Mr. Briggs. Oh, thank you. in Sector 7, Code 4. Repeating, Code 4. Be on the lookout for two-tone coupe. License number 1W67713. Repeating, all units, Code 4. Missing, Dr. Douglas P. as in Paul Mott. Male Caucasian, 32 years of age. Height, 6 foot 3. Weight, 195 pounds. Color of hair, blonde. Color of eyes, blue. Last seen driving away. License number 1W67713. Dr. Martin. What are you doing with this? Any special reason for placing it under this rock?
Where's your phone? Over there behind the bunk. Operator, give me Crestview 95359. All units in Sector 7, Code 4. Repeating, Code 4. Be on lookout for two-tone cafe. License number 1W67713. Operator, are you sure you're dialing the right number? We'll try it again, will you? It's my home. There ought to be someone there now. At junction of Highway 66 and Beach, ambulance en route. Car 17, Code 7, fourth and robbery. Suspects may be armed. Repeating, Code 2 to all units. Dr. Douglas P. S. and Paul Mott, male Caucasian, 32 years of age, height 6 foot 3, weight 195 pounds, color of hair blonde, color of eyes blue. Missing, Dr. Douglas P. S. and Paul Mott, male Caucasian. Repeating, go to the volume. Hey, mister! Give me the police, quick. Central. This is Briggs. This is Briggs. Come in. Subject, Dr. Douglas Martin, last seen in Route 61, heading toward North Junction. Stopped at gas station, corner of Ridgewood and Mills Road. Acknowledge. Roger. Briggs, out. Martin, you're with friends. You'll be all right. Now, let me go. Let me go. Steady now, steady, Doc. He'll kill everyone. We've got to stop now. Easy, Doug, easy. <clears throat> what did you give him? Sodium amatol. Truth serum. It'll deprive his mind of any imagination. I guess you'll make sense now. I'll get the recorder ready. Can you hear me, Dr. Martin? Yes. Now listen to me. I want you to count backwards from 100. Do you understand? Backwards from 100. 100? Doing with the information you took from Dr. Kruger's vault? 
I was delivering it. Delivering it? But where? To the rocks in Soledad Flats? Yes. To Soledad Flats. There where we crashed. I was delivering it, just as I was ordered. Who ordered you to do this, Dr. Martin? I'll tell you the whole story. I remember we were circling the atomic cloud. So it was an object blowing beneath us at Soledad Flats. We were going down to investigate. Controls jammed. Couldn't pull out. When I regained consciousness, I was on a table. Next thing I knew, they were coming at me. Strange people. Their eyes, uh, those horrible eyes. They didn't speak. I, I could see something strange and eerie pulsating in front of me. Then one of them lowered it toward my chest. It was my own heart. What happened? What is this place? Who are you? What are you doing to me? Can't you speak? Who are you? quite well. You have recovered from your unfortunate accident. Who are you? A scientist like yourself. Where do you come from? From a planet yet unknown to you. You know my name. You speak English. We speak every language. You can't expect me to believe that. I'm getting out of here. Stay where you are. the electron bridge we have created. Electron bridge? You mean you come and go just like that? Without anyone ever seeing you? Our ships have been sighted on numerous occasions by your people. Then why haven't we been able to track one down? We have a warning system similar to your primitive radar. Our machines are set to change course at the mere approach of a pursuing object. Let's say I do believe you. Where are we right now? In a cavern within the upper crust of the Earth. How long have you been here? Since the beginning of your experiments in nuclear fission. What have you got to do with that? We are accumulating the energy released with each of your atomic explosions. moment. No, I hear Peter. Who is Peter? 
pup. No virus. Virus. I love it. Now, Nino. Yeah, you know. Never seen him. Yeah, I read it. Yes, you know. Well, you know. I was needy rest. What was that? A report from the monitor we sent to the surface to obtain the results of your last nuclear test. Results? They'll take days to analyze and compute. I think you will find the figures are correct. I can't believe it. Where is that man? You don't recognize the area? No. He is in the vicinity where you crashed. That rock was glowing. A normal reaction in view of the amount of radiation absorbed. You have a remarkable memory, Doctor, considering the fact that you did not survive the crash. What do you mean? The mechanism of your heart had ceased to function. It was necessary for us to revive it. You were dead. I was dead? So that's what they were doing. You didn't even try to help the pilot. Why did you save me? Because we had an important need of your services. Such as? Look this way, Doctor. You will understand. Get up. You are the first of your world to be looking at our solar system, the Astron. This is our planet, Astron Delta. It occupies the fourth position in relation to this, our Sun. Yes, go on. During the 23rd time rotation, our sun began to die. So, during the succeeding generations, as our planet began to cool, vegetation began to disappear. Our eyes developed to this state to combat the ever-growing darkness. We were forced to migrate. You left your planet? Where? We invaded these neighboring planets. They were nearer to our sun. feeble attempts to stop us, but we were prepared for such contingencies. And now that our sun is about to completely expire, we must move again in order to survive. Yours is the only planet in this solar system capable of supporting our civilization. This is fantastic. Over a billion of you trying to come here to Earth. We have no alternative. We have been putting our plan to work for some time. At the proper moment, the invasion will be launched from our platforms, which are being readied in space. Nothing can stop us. This is ridiculous. You cannot find your way in or out of this cavern. Do not try to leave.
discovered our menagerie. Don't you think you will be more at ease on this side of the cage? It's horrible. What are you doing here? We are breeding our, shall I say, armies. Those carnivorous insects and animals? Look at them. Their growth is due to a change in their genes. With your next nuclear test, these animals will multiply at a rate beyond imagination. When the time comes, we will unleash them. They will spread to every continent and devour every living thing on the surface of the Earth. What good will that do you? How could you expect to survive better than we? We have provided for that. No, Doctor. Look over there. to fertilize the soil. Vegetation will rise up in abundance. A new era of civilization will begin. Gamma rays? You see, Doctor, we have arranged for everything. Wait a minute. All this equipment? Our nuclear storage units. To date, we have accumulated several billion electron volts as a result of your atomic explosions. Several billion? Why, a, a chain reaction at this point could release enough unstable isotopes to, to create a new and powerful element. Might be impossible to control. True. An element that will never be known by your scientists. I can assure you the strength of this new element will... Well, this is a powder keg. Could go off at any minute. I assure you, Doctor, we have everything under our complete control. What force could possibly be strong enough to harness the... Well, you control your whole operation by electricity. Of course, no generators, no generators. That means you're getting your power from somewhere on the surface. It must be passing through here. You have heard enough, Dr. Martin. Step inside. All right. What do you want from me? You will have access to advanced information relative to the time and strength of the forthcoming atomic tests. What about it? You will provide us with that information as soon as it is available. I see. You're afraid of an overload. You can't tap enough electricity wherever you get it from to control a strong enough charge. You are a clever man, Doctor. Perhaps too clever. And what makes you think I'll give you any information? It is the only way you can save your own life when the time comes. You will be transported to one of our platforms in space and resettled here when our operation is completed. You're asking me to sabotage the entire world. Three billion people. They are doomed in any case. Well, I guess there's no alternative. I'll have to do as you say. You are lying, Doctor. Your only wish is to betray us. No. I know. Your thoughts have been recorded. Lie detective? Call it what you like. You force me to resort to other methods. I will contact our space station. You are an unwilling subject, Dr. Martin. What? Who are you? I am Vitala. You will listen and obey. No, I... You will remember nothing you have seen or heard here. Nothing but my orders. 
what you will obey. Yes. You will obtain the data and bring it to the stone near the place where your plane was wrecked. To the stone. What have you seen or heard here? What have you seen or heard here? Nothing. Repeat my orders. I will obtain the data and bring it to the stone. I did. I took the information to where they told me. I didn't realize I was being mesmerized. Why didn't somebody say something? Don't you believe me? Kurt, you understand. These giant animals breeding by the millions, they'll devour everything unless we stop them. Of course, Doug, we will. Colonel. Colonel, you've got to arrange to set off another bomb tonight. The strongest charge we have. They're beneath the ground with all their equipment. We can blow them to pieces. Now, wait a minute. A strong charge will overload their units. You don't believe me, Colonel? Major? Kurt? Of course we do. Easy, Doug, easy. You think I'm crazy, all of you. Well, I'm not, do you understand? Everything I said is true. I saw it with my own eyes. Give me a hand, Doug. Now, let me go. Let me go. Steady, steady, steady. Take it easy now. Take it easy. We'll talk this whole thing over. What are you doing to me now? And just rest quietly. That's it. Mrs. Martin should be along any minute now. She went for their car. What'll I tell her? Well, he's in a state of shock. Tell her he's resting quietly. Well, excuse me, I think I'd better wait for her at the information desk. Well, Dr. Martin seems to be indestructible, except for those hallucinations. Those weren't hallucinations, Colonel. Under the influence of sodium amytol, a patient loses all control of his imagination. Well, then he shouldn't be able to fabricate those stories. That's right. Major, you're not trying to tell us that everything he said was true. Look, gentlemen, I can only give you the medical facts. As for the rest, you'll have to decide for yourself. Excuse me, please. Dr. Kruger. Chilly, isn't it? Oh, Mr. Briggs, you startled me. I didn't expect to see anyone here. Well, uh, neither did I, Doctor. Well, I suppose you want me to explain why I'm here. Mm-hmm. I want to believe Doug. We've worked together a long time. Anyway, I just had to come out here and check for myself. Check what, Doctor? For an entrance or an exit to the caverns he described. I'm afraid you're wasting your time. Have a cigarette, Doctor? No, thank you. See, we've already covered the entire area. We couldn't find a thing. Then, what about that scar? I'd like to see you disprove that. Oh, Mrs. Martin. Oh. How is he, Doctor? Oh, he's resting fine. I think he'll be all right. How's the car?
Keep away, I say. Stop. Let me go. They're after me. Nobody's after you, Dr. Martin. Keep away. Ducky, he's trying to help you. I don't need the help. I, I want to see Kurt right away. Now, you control yourself. And I'll call him just as soon as you get back to your room. You get back into bed and I'll call Dr. Kruger. Uh, I've got to figure something out before he gets here. I need a pencil, some paper, and a slide rule. I'll see that you get it. Oh, can I have Dr. Kruger, please? Dr. Kruger speaking. Oh, yes, Major. How is he? All right, I'll be over in a few minutes. as soon as I could. Is there anything wrong? He's much better. Imagine he's even started working. He asked for paper and a slide rule. That's interesting. Wonder what he's up to. Formulas, equations. Anyway, whatever he says, pretend to agree with him. Major Cliff's orders. Of course. Doug. Doug Kurt's here. Hello, Doug. In just a second, I'm almost finished. I'll take your hat. Thank you. Kurt, let's face it. I know that you all think there's something wrong with me. No, of course not. No, I, I wouldn't blame you after the story I told last night. Well, frankly, you did have us a little worried asking that the bomb be dropped because of what you said. You don't believe me either. Kurt, I tell you, I've been there. I've seen what they're doing, breeding animals into carnivorous monsters. But I don't need a bomb to stop them. I figured it out. It's all here. Now, look. Here's the nuclear strength of our last test. And this is the amount of electricity needed to control it. Let me see that. I had to estimate the conversion rates of their transformers. These figures are correct. Such transformers must operate on a constant supply of electricity. Where could they get that much electric power? Only one way. They must tap it from the main lines of the powerhouse. Could do it by parallel induction. Nobody would ever know the difference. All we have to do is to cut it off. Cut off the power? We can't do that. It would cause untold damage for miles around. Such a power stoppage must be planned in advance. Eight to ten seconds, that's all I need. That gap in supply will short out their resistors and the whole thing will go up. But you won't go along with that. No, no, not you. Doug, sure, get back in bed. Now look, you're carrying this out of my way. Doug! Call the main gate and try to stop Dr. Martin. Doug took the car. Hurry. Dr. Martin. Stop. Stop. He did what? How long ago? Right, we'll leave immediately. What's wrong, Colonel? Dr. Martin. He's on his way to the powerhouse, wants to cut off the power supply. Let's go. I couldn't stop him, Doctor. He went that way.
driver of this car. He went into the building. Walking or something, mister? Where are the switches that control the solar lab class area? to be reasonable. I said cut it. Now the next one. Next. Go on. That'll turn the power off for 100 miles. Do as I say. Here it is. Stay where you are. On that gun, Dr. Mutt. I'm warning you, Colonel. How many closer and I'll kill him. Now the next one. What's this one? That's the master switch. Cut it. Doug, please, don't. I said cut it. Get back or I'll kill him. Go on, get back. Go on, get back. Do as he says. Give me 10 seconds after I cut the power. If I'm insane, nothing will happen and you can do what you want with me. But if I'm right. Now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Bob, that was one nipple I could have done without. Oh, hi there. I hope you liked that movie. I meant what I said. It was a classic piece of sci-fi fluff. The science to it didn't really work, and we didn't care. The aliens were invading, and we had to defend ourselves. There are any number of odd glitches in it, though. At one point, the alien is speaking an alien language, and what he is saying is, the readings are 25, 26 to the right, 27, 28, 29 to the left, 30, 31 up, 32, 33 down, and they just played it in reverse. Now, most movies played the credits at the beginning, and this one they specifically played at the end. I don't know why. 
Maybe it was the invention of the second card, which is what you call the end credit scenes. As I said, there's a lot of stock footage there. Uh, there's a lot of military stock footage and some sci-fi movies. For instance, the alien city that we see when our character is underground with a Martian is the Martian city from Flight to Mars from 1951. Also, while he's down there, uh, Mr. Deneb zaps him with something, and that's an old model heat lamp. Now, while I joke about their eyes, were, they're not made out of snowballs. They're actually made out of the bottoms of egg cartons. So this was a super cheap little movie. Now, interestingly, there's a little futuristic reference. The FBI agent is named Briggs. Now, when they did Mission Impossible, the first supervisor we see is not Peter Graves, but Dan Briggs, played by Stephen Hill. And he backed out of the series, and they brought Peter Graves in. So I have no idea if there's a connection there, but it's one of those six-degree separation. I don't know. But the name is Briggs for both characters. Now, again, in the underground scene, the surgical table is actually a uh, bed made out of glass bricks. And if the costumes for the aliens look a little bit familiar, they're leftovers from the serial The Phantom. You know, you may notice they talk about the coupe. He's driving the coupe. I'm not sure why they call it a coupe. But this is the car he crashes into a tree in the beginning of the film, and then like a day or two later, it's completely undamaged. I understand they used a lot more metal in cars back then. Now, interestingly, at one point, Dr. Martin comes into an office and the lights are already on, but you see him flip on the light switch, but nothing changes. Watch the clock. They don't all seem to be saying the same time, or at least not anything in linear time. Once is this, once is that. And for our new aeronauts out there, the rescue helicopter starts off as a Sikorsky H-19 Chickasaw, and then turns into a Bell 48 H-12. Again, in the beginning, we see our heroes in a swept-wing saber jet, which changes into a Lockheed Shooting Star. That's what happens when you're using nothing but stock footage. Now, there are a couple science things with this, you know, talking about bringing a billion people or something to the planet. There are only 2.6 billion people at the time on Earth, and that was, would have been something quite scary. And they talk about having storage for several trillion electron volts. Well, that's enough power to power a 100-watt light bulb for about one second, maybe. Now, of course, the gas station attendant didn't listen to police bands on their AM radios either, but we'll forgive them for that. It's a great plot contrivance. Personally, I love the end, where they're looking out the glass window from the power station at the nuclear bomb explosion that's only a few miles away. That's the last thing they'll ever see. It was a lot of fun back then because we didn't really know much about science. We forgave so much. Much like the people who made our Netflix and chill moment. This week on Netflix and Chill, we have Cowboys and Aliens. Yes, it's a familiar plot. Aliens are coming. Oh, they're already here. And they're getting ready to attack. And some poor, helpless schmuck finds them, this time a cowboy. Yeah, there's a bit of a gimmick with the wrist bracelet, but really, the movie is a piece of fluff, so enjoy it for what it is. Watch it this week, Cowboys and Aliens. Well, that's our show this week. Tune in next week when who knows what we'll have, because we never do. But until then, remember to wash your hands like you've just murdered the rightful king, and that he's Bob, I'm Al, and we'll see you at the movies. Bob wants you to remember, as kids, parents teach you not to believe everything you see on TV. But now as an adult, you have to keep reminding them not to believe everything they see on Facebook. That is so true. People will believe anything if it's on Facebook. Thank you.